Good morning. It is so good to have each and every one of you with us this today as we begin our new study this morning in the book of Daniel. So I'd invite you to grab your Bible. It may be handed to you there and open it up to Daniel chapter one, where we'll begin this morning. But as we always do, we want to begin with a word of prayer. I would invite you to, in the place where you're at, to open up your heart to God, to lift up any concerns that you may have to the Lord in the place where you sit. This is a principle that's very much found in the book of Daniel, as Daniel found himself living in another country. And it is so important to us to know that God was with Daniel in that place as well. Right. Father, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given each one of us to come here today uh, to open your word together. Lord, to, we invite you, Lord, to speak to our hearts as we open your word, as we, as we read from these messages that you have left us for all of these centuries that apply just as well today as they did in the days of Daniel. Lord, we have many concerns in our lives as, as our, our world can tend to be shaky. Things can change dramatically, even overnight. Uh, Lord, we, we have to learn to place these things in your hands and to tr entrust ourselves to you in these hard times that may come upon us. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our friends. We pray for those whom we care about who are sick. Uh, Lord, we pray for their healing. Lord, that you could provide for them. Lord, we ask that you would provide that healing in each, case, each and every case. Lord, we pray for our leaders and our nation as they need to step up and they need to learn to govern by your ways, Lord, and, and to keep themselves within your guidance and your morality. Lord, we just ask that your will be done in each and every case. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed how people's behavior changes depending on where they are? They're quiet and deeply respectable when they visit a memorial like the tomb of the unknown soldier. Yet they're loud and they're boisterous at a sporting event. The culture of the society places certain expectations on people depending on the place and the event. You're expected to cheer and yell at a football game, but to cheer and yell at an art museum and security is probably going to be called immediately. The setting within the ch culture is expected to define our behavior. But what do we do when the culture calls for us to act in a way that's just not right? What do we do when the culture calls for us to act contrary to God's ways as defined in his word? So as we come to the book of Daniel, we, we first begin to look at the setting of the book. Daniel chapter one, verse number one. We read, in the third year of the reign of Je 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 Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, this statement by Daniel, the very first statement in his book, dates his book. Because we can, we can date this with historical records of when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with his army and began to besiege Jerusalem. That was in 606 through, through 605 B.C. So to go along with that, I want to take a look at a map here with you. 
as you can see on this map, let me give you some room here to see it well. This right here is the Persian Gulf. Okay, here is what was in the day called Babylonia. Babylon is right here, the capital city of Babylonia. Um, there was a great king named Nabopolassar that rose to power. And in 626 BC, I'm sorry, 612 BC, he took his army up to the capital city of Assyria, right up here. He took his army to Nineveh, and in 612 BC, Nabopolassar defeated the armies of Assyria at Nineveh. Then if we come right across here, the armies of Assyria, when they were defeated, they, they fled across to Haran, which is right here on the map. And at Haran, uh, the king of Babylon moved over there. And in 610 BC, or two years later, totally wiped out the armies of Syria once and for all. Then he went back to his kingdom and he began to put everything in order as he is now the king of both Babylonia and the Assyrian Empire, which extends far to the east and, and far to the west and the south in Palestine. All of that land became his. He became king of all those areas that were once controlled by Assyria. Now, Nabucodonosor, king of Babylon, died in 606 BC. We see that documented in Jeremiah 25, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, his son, succeeded his father as king of Babylon. Now, it's important enough for us to note that Nebuchadnezzar had at that up to the point of his father's death had been the general of Nabopolassar's armies. And, and when he took his armies into battle, it was really his son, Nebuchadnezzar, that was leading those armies in those great battles. So Nebuchadnezzar was a wise general. As there was a change in leadership in Babylonia, and Babylonia, by the way, owned all the land all the way around through Palestine, just till you get just north of Jerusalem. And so they thought that since there was a change of power in Babylonia, that they would side with the Egyptians now against Babylonia, and they, and they combined their armies together, and their combined army went under Pharaoh Necho II up to Carchemish, which is right up here in the southern part of what's modern day Turkey, where Nebuchadnezzar brought Babylonia's armies and met them and totally defeated the army of Egypt at Carchemish. Thusly, that left as the as the army of Egypt, what was left of it, began to retreat southward from Carchemish back through Palestine and back to Egypt. That left the road wide open for Nebuchadnezzar's army to march right down, following along the same path, and to march right up and encircle Jerusalem, right here on the map in Judah. And he besieged Jerusalem in 605 BC, the same year that he defeated the Egyptian army at Carchemish. He came right down to Jerusalem next, and he surrounded Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay, so let's, let's move to our verse number two. There we read, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand 
Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, this tells us that, that Jehoiakim surrendered to the army of Babylon, and he made himself a vassal in his country, Judah, a vassal of Babylon in 605 BC. This is just as was prophesied by Isaiah when Isaiah was alive. Isaiah's dead by now, but he prophesied in Isaiah 43, 14, that just this would happen. Now, the, these events were documented in 2 Kings 24, verse 1, and 2 Chronicles 36, verses 5 through 8. It also documents that some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried, he carried to the house of his God. The nation of Judah was brought down by God. We learned from our study that we did just previous to this in Ezekiel that the nation of Judah was brought down by God because of their idolatry and their sin, just as God had promised clear back when he gave them their promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In this text, we see a mention of the land of Shinar. Now, Shinar is the Hebrew name for Babylon. It's the same name that Isaiah uses in Isaiah chapter 39 through 43. Shinar means country of two rivers, which is referring to the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers right there that run on either side of the city of Babylon. The people of Shinar were originally descended from Sim or Semites, as they're called today. Uh, we also see mentioned here the land of Chaldeans. Okay, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, was a Chaldean, we're told in Scripture, and the land of the Chaldeans, we're also told in Scripture was Abraham's native land, which we know from history was overrun run by the Amorites, who are descendants of Ham. Okay, they're Hamites instead of Semites, and they overran the land of Ur shortly after Abraham's death. Nebuchadnezzar took the treasures from Solomon's temples and placed them before his God. Now, let me tell you a little bit about why he did that. Babylon had many gods. Okay, we know this from history. And we also know this from the book of Daniel, and we also know it from the book of Ezekiel. But their primary god was, was a, a god with a little g called Marduk or Marduk or Bel. Bel is actually Marduk's title, okay, but he's often called Bel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar wrongly assumed that his God had given him victory over God's people, even over the one true living God, Yahweh himself. Now, God would later make Daniel his vessel that he sent to show Nebuchadnezzar just how wrong he was. We'll see that later in places like Daniel chapter 4. Now, from Isaiah and Ezekiel, we learn that the invasion of Judah by Babylon was the next step in God's judgment upon Israel for their idolatry and their sins. Judah would be invaded twice more, as we learned from Ezekiel in our study that we just completed, and by the Babylonian, Babylonian armies during the lifetime of Daniel. Daniel was with in the first attack on Jerusalem. There were some there were some captives taken back to Babylon. Daniel was amongst that first set in 605. In 597, a second invasion of Jerusalem will happen, and another larger set of deportees will be taken 
back to Babylon. And with that group would be Ezekiel. And he would thusly write the, the book that he wrote while Daniel was living in the city of Babylon itself. Ezekiel and these other deported Jews are living in the areas around working as slave labor. And then finally, in 586 BC, Babylon is going to come and to completely destroy Jerusalem and burn the temple of God to the ground. When we come down to verse three, we read, then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. In verse three, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar instructed his chief official in his palace, a guy named Ashpenaz, to gather from the Jewish deportees some of the youth who were some of the king's descendants, okay, or some of the nobles of Judah, as we also see in written in Jeremiah 24 and 25, okay, Jeremiah calls them the, the strongest and the best of Israel's young people. In Ezekiel 20, in Jeremiah 25, we see that this was the beginning of the 70 years of captivity for the Jews as prophesied by Jeremiah. Daniel was one of those best and most promising and were taken captive. The, the practice of him deporting the best and the brightest from a conquered nation served two purposes. It was very it was done by Assyria as well. Okay. Number one, it weakened the resolve and the ability of the defeated nation to mount an uprising because their strongest and best leaders were taken away from them. Number two, it strengthened the nation of Babylon to integrate wise leaders into their culture so that they would they would they took them in while they were still very young and were also impressionable. So they're going to be integrated into the Babylonian society. If we look at verse four. Nebuchadnezzar stipulated that these youths were to serve in the king's palace he stipulated that these youth were going to serve in the king's palace and they would had to be gifted in all wisdom they had to be intelligent they needed to be able to learn new things quickly they they had to be without blemish and without defect which meant they had to be physically strong they would deserve they would serve and be trained by the king's court under a three-year program as was the custom in the day of babylon in the day in the day in babylon it was babylon's practice that required those representing the king to be strong and handsome without visible physical defects Babylonians place great importance on physical appearance. Like maybe it's just like America today. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the the good looking are the ones who have all the advantages. And and so they were going to serve in the king's court under a three year program, which was the custom of the day in Babylon. It was Babylonian practice that required those representing the king to, to have be intelligent. And the, and the king wanted to surround himself with, with intelligent people. They were being groomed to become the king's representatives or ambassadors. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, 
we are told that we as believers in Jesus Christ are created by Christ to be the ambassadors of God in our world as well. Uh, so these, these young people, including Daniel, they were to learn the Babylonian language and literature. It goes right down here at the bottom that they were to learn the Babylonian language and literature. Okay. Babylon, Babylon, Babylon at the time in the world in world history was the learning center of, of the world. Uh, much Babylonian literature has been uncovered even today. It's called Akkadian Neo-Babylonian literature. Uh, much of it is, has been discovered by archaeologists. Uh, Babylonian sages were guardians of the sacred traditional lore uh, covering natural history, astronomy, mathematics, medicine, myth, and chronicles. Okay. These sages that recorded these things were considered specialists in the fields of magic and astrology. These are the descendants of these very people are the magi that are described during the days of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. This course would be 600 years later, but we need to know that this is, this is a, con a continuation of a long-standing Babylonian tradition that was established clear back before Daniel. These sages were religious and, and supernatural. They had supernatural aspects of purificate the right to purification sacrifice inspection of the internal organs of animals to be able to predict the future uh, what's called incantations okay exorcisms uh, divination especially by dreams okay most of the book of Daniel was originally written in Aramaic. And this is because that was the contemporary language of international business in that day throughout the Middle East. And so Daniel was expected to speak Aramaic because it was the common language of the day. Daniel and other captives offered no resistance to learning the language and literature. We see no evidence of that in the book of Daniel. Now, why did they not object to learning the language and the literature and the customs of the Babylonians? They realized that they were there for the long haul. Probably for the rest of their lives, they were going to be in Babel. So they were probably eager to be able to learn as much as they could about the Babylonian culture so that they would be able to function and live more effectively in that culture. Now we come down to verses five through seven. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuch gave new names. He gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Well, let's just talk about this a little bit right now. Um, among these young Judean nobility, we see the names of, of Daniel, Ananiah, Michelle, 
Mishael, and Azariah. They were all four around 14 to 17 years of age. They are relatively young teenagers. As a part of their, quote, brainwashing that they were going to be getting and their cultural reorientation, <coughs> excuse me, as a part of their cultural reorientation under the, under the Babylonians, these young men were assigned Babylonian names. Okay, so that Daniel, who's name in Hebrew meant God is my judge. His name was changed to the Babylonian name Belshazzar, which means Bel protect the king. Ananiah, whose name in Hebrew meant the Lord is gracious, was changed to Shadrach, who's in the name in Babylonian means command of Atu. Excuse me. Mishael, his name in Hebrew means who is like God. His name was changed to Babylonian word Meshach, who is what Aku is. Okay, you see how they're similar, but they're now focused instead on the one true living God of Israel, Yahweh, and they're now focused on the many gods of Babylon. Azariah's name in Hebrew meant the Lord is my helper. In Babylonian, he got the name Abednego, which means servant of Nego. Now, this is an, a deliberate attempt to echo constant contradictions to the truth regarding God and his power. An attempt to halt the speaking of God's name and praise to him. The new name marked new ownership, it held a new identity for that young man. God originated this practice himself by renaming people, the, some of the patriarchs, of the Old Testament, Abram was renamed Abraham. Jacob was renamed Israel. Now, Satan copies and perverts God's ways. We see this renaming by the Babylonians as, as one of those cases where evil is copying what God does and perverts it and distorts it. Okay, we need to understand this in our world today, that what on the surface might appear to be good, when it is distorted, it becomes evil. And so we need to be really careful about knowing exactly what God's word says and what God, how God wants us to live. And this was very true of these young men in that day as well. So let's go to the next slide, which is chapter, is verse number five, where we read, and the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. The youths were to be fed with food from the king's table. The word translated delicacies there in verse 5 can be translated rich food. Okay. The Babylonian objective was to totally assimilate or absorb these young people into their worldly and ungodly culture. Christ's, object, Christ's objective for his people is to go into the worldly culture, yes, just like this, but to remain set apart from the ways of the world and devoted to the culture 
of God and his word, okay, and to follow his ways in every matter. The old covenant law strictly forbade these young Hebrew men from eating the food from the king's table. We see the, the dietary law that was handed down in Leviticus 11. Also, the dietary law uh, excluded gluttonous lifestyles of, of, of eating way too much of, of rich food such that you gain weight and you get out of shape and you lose your health. The Babylonians of the day ate a couple of things that were absolutely expressly forbidden in Luke, I mean, in Leviticus 11. First is pork. Uh, pork was a staple of the Babylonian diet. And another thing that they ate was horse meat. Okay. And, and so both of those are forbidden in Leviticus uh, for the people of Israel. Our culture in America today is increasingly pagan and permits, even promotes ungodly behavior. The Christian is tempted in everyday life to conform himself or herself to the norms of our culture. We see it everywhere we go, on the job, in our relationships, socially, in the privacy of our own homes as we watch the internet and television. We have a choice to make thereby every single day as people who belong to God through his son, Jesus the Christ. Going down to Eight through ten. Verse eight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Seemingly, without hesitation, Daniel purposed in his heart, or determined, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, or it could be translated resolved in his mind or made up his mind not to be untrue to his commitment to God as written in God's scriptures. At some point in his life, Daniel had earlier set his mind to obey God in his ways. At some point earlier in his life, Dan, Daniel had made a profession of faith to God and had committed his life and the, and the ways that he lived to God's purpose and God's plan for him and God's word. The first portion of the king's food, according to Babylonian custom, had been offered to pagan gods in their honor. Daniel requested to the chief of eunuchs that he not be forced to, quote, defile himself. In verse 8, the expression, the chief of the eunuchs, is slightly different from the title given to Ashpenaz, though it is close enough that Ashpenaz is likely who was intended here. So this is probably Ashpenaz again. The Mosaic food laws in Levit Leviticus 11 were signs and symbols of Daniel's inner cleansing by God. And just as our behaviors in society are signs to unbelievers that may see us of our inner change in Christ Jesus, Daniel felt that accepting a royal diet meant accepting the idols associated with it and the pagan ways of the people of Babylon. Our faithful behavior toward God indicates to a sinful world that we have been set 
apart by God and are keeping ourselves holy to God in all that we do and set apart for his purposes in our lives. God expects every person who believes in him to be disciplined in his word, just like Daniel was. We are free in Christ, but we cannot turn our freedom into moral license. Godliness is never accidental. Neither is victory against temptation coincidental. God demands consistency and faithfulness to him in our lives. Consistency to walk and talk becomes a transportable cloak of protection that's all around us all the time. We will never reach perfection in this lifetime, but we certainly can reach consistency. Remember that Satan's darts are always aimed at our points of inconsistency and our weaknesses. That is where he will try to bring you and I down. Now, I, I want to stop right here. Daniel felt very strongly about eating this food. Okay. Now, did Daniel approach his supervisor in an arrogant, holier than thou, thou defiant matter? No. Did, did Daniel make an assault on the Babylonian religion? No. Daniel simply sought permission from the commander, from the chief of eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Chief of eunuchs probably respected that as soon as he made that request. Let's, let's go down to verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of eunuchs. This is a very pertinent statement for us today as well. God caused that official to show favor to Daniel. God has access to the minds and wills of even unregenerate people, and he can control them as he wills. We have to always remember as believers, part of our faith is to believe that God is always in control. And that in any situation that we have been brought into, God has done that for his purpose. We also need to know that God is always with us, even in the middle of a pagan culture and a pagan situation. You see that in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, and, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. The chief official could have informed the king. The king could have taken the request as an insult to his authority and had Daniel killed as an example. God intervened so that didn't happen. That very likely could have been the easy way out for the, the chief eunuch. He may have seen Daniel even as a threat to his authority. And he didn't want to see Daniel as a competition. That's very possible. But God caused his mind to move in another direction. Okay, let's go down to verse 10. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. Or why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Now, Ashpenaz, the chief official of the king's court, raised a legitimate concern, a very real concern. One could not divert from the king's directives without fear of immediate and terrible reprisal, your own death. This fact underscores the boldness of Daniel's request. Each believer, each one of us 
must at this point think about the possibility of taking a courageous stand for Christ someday in our lives, whereby in doing so, he or she is risking status, income, or even life itself. An example, during World War II, the Christian theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer took a stand against Adolf Hitler and his mass murdering of Jews, and the Nazis' policy of euthanizing unwanted people. On the, he was punished greatly and imprisoned for most of World War II as a result. That's four years of his life, mostly spent behind bars in very bad conditions. And then if that was not bad enough, on the very eve of the Allied takeover of Berlin, Berlin on April 9th, 1945, one of the final orders given by Adolf Hitler was that Dietrich Bonhoeffer be hanged. Kind of makes you pause. Think. Any one of us could be required to risk our job, taking a stand for what God's word says is morally right or wrong. Will you or I be faithful to God no matter the risk to self or to family? The conviction Daniel held stands in stark contrast to that of the chief official. Daniel was willing to risk his own life to follow the will of God. But while the official was sympathetic to Daniel's desire, he was not convinced enough to risk his personal security. He feared that if he honored Daniel's request, it would endanger his own life and imperil his future in the royal palace. Now let's come on down to verse 11, 11 through 13. Here we read, So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your, your servants. Now, Daniel obviously had, had devoted much prayer to this. Okay, he, God was instrumental in giving Daniel this plan, this proposal. Okay. After God had given it to him, Daniel was obedient to God. He could have been afraid to deliver even this. He could have said, oh, oh Lord, I, I'm, I'm afraid to do that. I'm terrified. I'm, I don't think that's a good thing to do. But Daniel went to the steward or the guard, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, while they were in the king's court and proposed an ingenious first step word of solution. Limiting themselves to vegetables to eat and water to drink, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah circumvented any issues of eating unclean meats or drinking the king's wine. Okay, that's why he proposes this, that they, they eat only vegetables that have been raised from seeds. Okay. Daniel also allowed a short period of trial and at the same time allowing the steward the right to make the call about whether to risk continuing their diet so that Ashpenaz, who was over him, or even worse, the king, would actually notice a noticeable difference in these, these four Jewish young men. The steward 
would not would would do that by comparing the appearance of these four men, Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, with the other young people in the program. In Daniel's 10-day plan, the word translated vegetables, which you see there in your text, really means grain, fruits, and bread made from grains. Okay. In the Hebrew, that's what that really means. So grain, fruits, bread, and things that are made from grain. Okay. Believers should participate in some extent in the dominant culture and its customs. We have to. If we want to if we want to do God's will in our world, we've got to participate to some extent in the dominant culture. But we must ask God at what point we will experience defilement. Believers must at that point exercise the courage to obey God rather than men, no matter what the cost. This involves living by faith in God's ways. For Daniel and company, that meant trusting that God would nourish their bodies well enough that the king would not respond unfavorably to anyone. Okay, so that's, Daniel's not asking that these other leaders in Babylon risk their own lives for this purpose. He says, here's a plan. Verses 14 through 16. So the chief of the eunuchs consented with them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. The double use of the pronoun them in that text indicated that all four of the Jewish men participate in the test. Okay? The verb tested is literally translated to try out. Okay, So he tried out. He tried Daniel's plan. Okay, Verse 15. Look at verse 15. It says, at the end of 10 days, Jewish men look better than their peers in the training program. The literal translation says the Jewish men were fatter in flesh fatter in flesh after 10 days than the other men. In response, the steward continued to remove, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, continued to remove their portion of, delic of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink. The context strongly implies a physical exercise regimen in which the group was participating also. This was possibly a military type regimen. Now, how did they gain and retain muscle mass better than the than that on that low fat, low protein diet? Obviously, God sustained them physically so that they not only suffered no ill effects, but that they prospered. They continued to get stronger. God caused them to put on muscle while they were being obedient to him. Uh, God may have even had some influence on the, on the nuts and the grains that were being put before them such that they actually were nuts and grains that had high content in protein. There are those out there. Okay? We don't know what they were. They're not named. And in verse 16, we see that they were vindicated for their self-discipline and self-control and allowed to continue practicing God's will for their lives to change in their culture. While Babylon did everything it could to indoctrinate their minds and steal their souls, God granted the young men his own knowledge and understanding in every matter. 
brothers and sisters, with the internet. Our society is trying to steal our children's souls. Understand the truth in that. We must bring our children up and keep them close to the Lord. Keep speaking to them about the choices that they are being given and how they are being challenged by what they see on the internet. Most importantly, God's people must retain a God-centered worldview while we're living in the middle of this pagan culture that is in our world today. Verse 17. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God gave them, underscores the divine education provided to them according to God's omniscient plan. Daniel and the rest of his Jewish compatriots had no control over the forces and events that they encountered in their exile in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar, but God did. But these men, as well as every believer in God, down through history, had control over their own actions and personal relationship with God. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. I think this is very pertinent. Paul's saying the same thing. Therefore, I am well content with weakness and insults and distresses and persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. God gave these men, knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. The double use of the Hebrew phrase, in all, right here, indicates that they grew in all types of wisdom and understanding. The knowledge, that word knowledge that's used there, it describes the depth of learning the young men were able to master. Understanding denotes intelligence and skill combined. Wisdom speaks of applied knowledge. God enables these to take what they had learned and to apply it skillfully in each situation that presented itself before them. Hard work. And disciplined study habits were very important. But the success of these four men was directly attributed to God's, to God's provision. These men did not withdraw from the Babylonian culture, but they lived within it and they gained godly wisdom through prayer and living by faith in God. In Romans 8, 26, it says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too steep for words, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. It was God's will that these things go on in the lives of these four men. God was going to use them greatly in the very capital city of the Babylonian Empire. God, it also says that God gave Daniel special understanding of all visions and dreams. God likely also blessed each of the other three with unique spiritual gifts according to his or her calling. There's just, it's just his in this case. I'm sorry, Abbott, but it's 
in our world, it's it's his or her. Any person, every person who's a believer in Jesus Christ has a calling by the Lord. And God will spiritually gift us to accomplish that calling. But God gave Daniel as a spiritual gift, discernment between truth and falsehood with respect to the ancient art of analyzing visions and dreams, which we find out from the succeeding context that Nebuchadnezzar believed in very strongly. We're not going to study those in detail in this study, so I want to mention those to you so that you spot them as we go through quickly. In Daniel 9, now Daniel 2, okay, very, next week's lesson, in Daniel 2, 19 through 24, Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of great statue, which none of his wise men, his astrologers, his magicians, nor his soothsayers could even discern. So Daniel, after prayer, God gave him the, the knowledge to be able to, to know what that dream was and to interpret it to Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 4, 19 through 27, Daniel will interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream of his own coming mental insanity and, the, and his restoration that would come as a result of repentance and faith in the one and only true living God, Yahweh of Israel. Then in Daniel 5, Daniel will interpret to King Belshazzar the handwriting on the wall by God's hand, announcing the coming demise of both the king and the kingdom of Babylon within the next 24 hours. God thereby gave Daniel a position within Nebuchadnezzar's inner circle of his most trusted advisor. Daniel never held to the dark magic practiced by the Babylonian seers, but he was enabled by God to see the real truth in visions and dreams. Now let's come down to verses 18 through 21. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought to the chief of the eunuchs. I'm sorry. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, all I'm sorry, and among them all, None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. Okay. These four, these four were selected to stand before the king because there was none that were better than those four. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. But let's, uh, let's look at some of this passage. Um, first of all, the phrase at the end of the days. Okay, we see right up here in verse 18. Okay. The end of the days refers to the end of the three-year training period. Okay, so this is three years later. Look at the king interviewed Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, as well as all of the other young men in the training program. These would be from Israel, and they would be from the other lands across Nebuchadnezzar's empire. Okay. If the four Hebrews failed to meet the king's expectations, then the Hebrews would perhaps have been executed. It is also likely that the chief official, Ashpenaz, in charge of training Daniel and his friends, as we saw in verse 10, may well have been executed as well for failing to effectively teach and train them. This was a time of very tense expectations about what will Nebuchadnezzar 
how he, will he judge these people? And the bottom line was, the bottom line was none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, and Azariah. None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Nebuchadnezzar selected them. Therefore, they were ser they served before the king. Nebuchadnezzar selected all four of these men and served in the court within, in his court within the palace. Now come down and look at verse 20. The king judged them to be 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. This means all the magicians and astrologers who had been in his in his in his presence, in his court, all of these years. They were 10 times better. These four men turned out this way, not because they tried harder, though they did, nor were they inherently stronger or more intelligent, but it was because it was God's plan for their lives, and they each chose to live by faith in God and walk according to God's will in every matter associated with it. That is the way we have success in life. To first of all, seek God's will, but then to, when God shows us his will for us, we need to have faith in him and trust in him and do exactly what he asks of us. Now let's go to, well, let's, let's just come down here and look at verse 21. Thus Daniel, excuse me, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel began his training to be an advisor to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon in 605 BC. Okay, that was documented at the very first verse of the book. Okay. The first year of Cyrus of Persia, we know from, his, from, from historical records, was 539 B.C. We also see in the text of our book that God also allowed Daniel to be installed in a position of high authority by Cyrus, the king of Persia, following the fall of Babylon to the Persians in 539 B.C. We learn that from this book. Then we come down to the very last three chapters of this book, or chapters 10 through 12, where it records a vision of Daniel that he had in the third year of King Cyrus, which would have been about 536 B.C. So if we take 536 and we subtract it from 635, 605, guess what we get? 70 years. Thusly, Daniel served here in Babylon, according to God's will, for 70 years. The entire 70 years that the Jews were deported to Babylon. Believers find knowledge and understanding when we trust God. God is able to take what he has given us and how he has gifted us and use it powerfully for his kingdom's purpose. God's word, his written word in the Bible challenges us to live with integrity when we face the world's pressures and compromise. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. Lord, we, we thank you for speaking to us from your word in this, these examples of Daniel. Lord, we, we ask, Lord, that, that we would be able to humble ourselves before you at this time, realizing that we, we probably... Each one of us, we probably haven't done the, the very best that we could do in, in, 
and searching out your will in our lives and 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 then obeying you and doing your will in each and every case. Lord, we we let our our own fears get in the way. We we let the world uh, show us misleading ways to go. Uh, we we sometimes follow the world. We we sometimes follow friends. Lord, we we sometimes follow leaders that don't know you. And Lord, we know that all those ways are gonna not lead to good results in our lives. We we learn that from this this story. And and Lord, we we have to come before you and humble ourselves at this moment as we see this powerful, powerful story. And Lord, we have to commit or recommit ourselves, Lord, to, to seeking your will, first of all, and then Lord, to doing your will when you show us what you would have us to do. In every matter of life, everything that we do, Lord, it needs to be done according to your will and your way. And Lord, we ask that you would empower us to do that as we re repent of our ways that we've gone wrong and we turn to following you completely in our lives. We ask all these things in the great name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.